folks, welcome in to yet another episode of That Betting Show, fresh off of summer hiatus. It is July 29th, 2019, your one-stop shop for all your sports betting needs. Hey, hey, look who's back. It's Teddy Zabransky. Give him a follow on Twitter at Teddy underscore covers. I'm Donnie Seymour at Right Side VP. Teddy, football returns this week. Trade deadline just a few days away. Let's get right into the hot topics. How about... Let's talk about chasing down some of these division leaders, Teddy. As we take a look here, the Indians have cut a double-digit lead by the Twins down to two games. It was actually one game until yesterday when Trevor Bauer had a meltdown on the mound, fires the ball over the center field fence, and now we're hearing about trade discussions. Do you buy to yourself? Teddy, how can we be sellers when we're right in the mix for a division title? It, it, it baffles me, okay, to even hear Cleveland in the discussion of being a seller. We're talking about a team that currently has a three-game lead in the wild card race. They're two games out of the division lead, and they still have 10 more games against the Twins between now and the end of the regular season. If you're telling me that that's the recipe for a seller, if that's what a seller is in the modern marketplace, if I'm the fan base, I riot there. From a betting standpoint, I don't care if the Cleveland sells or not. It doesn't matter. From a fan and from a baseball fan standpoint, the Indians even discussing being sellers is an affront to the game and doesn't make me happy on a Monday morning. No, you know what's interesting about this too, Teddy? I bring this up quite a bit when we talk about, you know, guys that buy in the sporting teams. No longer is this like the 20s, the 30s, and 40s where this is the family income. You have to make sure you make a buck on a day-to-day -day basis, a month-to-month -month turnover, a year-to-year -year turnover. When you have guys like Steve Ballmer buying up, you know, the Los Angeles Clippers, it's not so much that they want to make a paycheck there. You have to look forward. If you're going to say, you know what, we're going to make a run at this. We're going to take on salary. It's going to cost us $20 million in luxury tax that we're going to be not profitable this year. And maybe even the following year when you're losing 20 million dollars year over five years let's just say teddy it's a hundred million dollars but when you sell the team in 10 years you make a billion dollar profit so some of these guys you know getting into it just trying to make that day-to-day -day dollar should look elsewhere because also teddy i was even hearing that the minnesota twins possibly could be sellers and they're in first place yeah the one thing that we always have to remember is that when you're talking about who's a buyer who's a seller what the rumors are there's a lot of media out there. And, the, you know, sports media just gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year because people like to consume this type of content. And what does that mean? That means every reporter needs a story every single day, which means that sometimes silliness like the Twins are going to be traitors of the deadlines gets popped up <laughs> into the media. Writers need stuff to write about. I don't see either team selling. I really don't. And if they do, I'd be shocked. And if I was the fan bases, I'd be really pissed off. How about this one, Teddy? Get a little bit of a hot streak here. Get a four-game streak. We're ready to go. We're probably going to move Noah Syndergaard. Out of nowhere, you get a move where Marcus Stroman ends up on the New York Mets for two prospects. Now you have frontline pitching. You're going to make a run, Teddy. And then you sit there and scratch your head and be like, wait a second. New York Mets are six games back and now still talking about dealing Noah Syndergaard. Always interesting right up to the trade deadline, which is going to be on the 31st. We'll see what happens in the upcoming days. But get a little bit hot. Look, they're not one or two games in. And let's also not talk about Teddy. It's not really like you have to jump like one team or, you know, try to make up six games just versus the Phillies or just versus the Nationals. There's a couple teams in there. So an interesting move by the New York Mets to pick up Marcus Stroman here. There are nine teams in front of the Mets in the National League standings. You know, there's six teams out of the wild card spot, sure, but they got all of these other teams they have to jump in order to get it. Now, not to say the Mets are supposed to be sellers, but you're going in two directions at the same time. When you're trading, and we're not talking about minimal prospects. They traded two of their top six overall prospects, both pitchers. Syndergaard's on the block. Wheeler's on the block. And you're bringing in Stroman. It's like, what are you guys doing? What are you thinking? Does Stroman get retraded in the next 48 hours? I, I the, the Mets sometimes are a very baffling organization, and this move, another one of those that's a little bit of a head-scratcher for this better. That being said, Stroman grew up in New York. He's been able to keep the ball down all year effectively, and he may well be a bet-on pitcher at City Field. I think he, that, that has that potential. But from an organizational standpoint, a little bit of a head-scratcher. You can't be buying starting pitching and selling starting pitching at the same time, especially when you're talking about selling some of the true elite starters of the game. Yeah, it's kind of interesting too, Teddy, because when you take a look at some of the money that you could possibly make on the Mets, 20 to 1 if they can make it into the playoffs. We'll see what happens over the next couple of days. But you're right. If you're an organization and you sort of don't really know which way to go, I don't think beating up on the Pirates over the past couple of days is maybe going to move that needle in the right direction, saying, you know what, we can really make a run in this. But it will be interesting to see how it moves forward. But, Teddy, I'm talking about moving forward here. We're only talking about moving until Thursday night, professional football. 
if we sort of say it's professional football, still gets underway. It's nice to see the kickoff. It's nice to see the uniforms out there. Broncos and the Falcons in the Hall of Fame game on Thursday. Just talking football, Teddy. It's game week here. It sure is. And, of course, we'll talk a lot about preseason betting strategies, what we want to look for in August as opposed to in September or October. We'll break down the games on a day-by-day basis, week-by-week throughout the preseason. But I wanted to throw a couple of overall, I mean, really, what I would call my top two preseason tips right here, right now. Number one, the regular season doesn't matter. How good these teams are supposed to be in September has zero effect on how they're going to play in August. So you're like, oh, I want to be betting on the Patriots and the Eagles? No. I want to be betting against the Dolphins and the Lions and the uh, Cardinals? No. That's September. In August, it's what's the game plan for this week, and can they have a quarterback in there that can move the football in the second half or the fourth quarter? You know, those are the key factors, not what they're going to be. The second thing I have to talk about in the preseason that is as key as key can be is the key number of three in the regular season doesn't mean a damn thing in August. You don't want to be buying on threes, buying off threes. Remember, coaches don't play for overtime. So when they're down, you know, when they're down three, they won't kick the field goal. They'll go for it on fourth down. When they're down seven, they'll score the touchdown and then go for two. The key numbers in preseason, ones and twos, not threes, like they are in the regular season. No, it's a pretty good point that you pick up, too, Teddy, because also let's not forget, you're working on a lot of things. You're trying a lot of things, whether it's fourth down and two on the goal line. Instead of normal situations, sometimes you're going to kick the field goal. They're going to go for it there. And also, let's not forget when they score a touchdown, also trying to go for two-point conversions to work on that throughout the regular season. There's still some football to be done here, Teddy. As we left off a little bit earlier in the month, coming back today, we still got some football teams to go over, primarily a top 10 in college football left to get you ready for the college football kickoff, your top 20 college football preview today on that betting show, Teddy. It's going to be the Texas A&M Aggies. How about this? A 100-1 to ticket to win the 2019 title. Sounds a little bit off there, but let's not forget. Look at the division that Texas A&M is playing in. So even if they're listed as a top-10 team, you're scratching your head going, I can get a 100-1 to ticket. There's some reasons beyond those factors here. Uh, finishing up, or excuse me, the team total this year going to be 7.5 minus 134. So a little bit of juice on that over. A&M finished last year, Teddy, 9-4 and on the season, 5-3 and in SEC play. The one thing that you do have is Jimbo Fisher did return, I would like to say, the Texas A&M football team back to its winning ways, 9-4 and four last year, 5-3, and three, as we said, in SEC play. Looking at year two, taking a look, Kellen Mond's back at the helm. That offense should move. you got a lot of pass catchers back. You're going to have to try to repeat, replenish the running back position. But the one thing that's going to be interesting to keep an eye on, you play in the SEC. The defense was not up to snuff against the pass last year, Teddy, finishing 12th overall in the SEC. Looks like they're going to get an easy win to start the season. But, boy, it's never easy, Teddy, to go to Death Valley and head into play Clemson in week two, early September. Should be fun to watch for today's preview, Texas A&M. Sure, and when you talk about a top 10 team that's being priced at 100 to 1 to win a title, it tells you everything you need to know about their schedule. Okay? On the road, at Clemson, at Georgia, at LSU, and of course they have Alabama coming home. If they can split those games, they're going to have a hell of a season. That's a big if. (laughs) You know, uh, the Aggies can win one of those games, they should probably be happy. Um, But that's why they're in that price range to win it all. Because, of course, if you lose two uh, of those games, and, of course, there's an SEC title game after that. But if you lose two of those regular season games, you're in trouble when it comes to actually winning the national title. You talk about what they bring back. And, look, Kellen Mond had a real good year uh, last year. Um, They do bring back our loaded receiving core. They bring back four starters on the offensive line. You know, an offensive line that helped Travion Williams. What do you have, 1,700 yards and 18 touchdowns? That line returns nearly intact. Uh, this is a scary looking offensive team, but you talk about the defense. I mean, when you say what was better overall for the Aggies last year compared to uh, 2017 and previously, their defensive overall numbers were a lot better. 78th nationally to 32nd last year, 60 fewer yards per game, six fewer points per game in 2018 than in 2017. But now it's 2019 and that defense suffered major graduation losses, particularly uh, in the back seven. The defensive line looks okay. I've got a ton of concern about the Aggies' back seven, which means Texas A&M might be a fun team to bet overs with early in the season. 
How about this one, Ted? Usually, you know, fun betting and overs doesn't really mix in the preseason, but how about this for overnight line movers here on that betting show today? We finally kick it off, Teddy. NFL preseason open, and the reason why we bring it up a couple days is because we had some line movement this morning. Opened up Atlanta minus one. Now we're sitting at about a plus two and a half in that factor, switching over to Denver. A uh, total of 34. Money line in this game, minus 130, plus 110 split, both the, obviously the Broncos and the Falcons. First preseason game. Teddy, why is this line possibly on the move here early? Well, then let's remember, it's going to stick at two and a half because the markets are going to overvalue the three, like they always do in the preseason. Um, and that's why it's sticking at two and a half. It probably should be three uh, already. But it really comes down to three factors, this line move towards uh, the Denver Broncos. One, Dan Quinn doesn't care. Flat out, doesn't care. He said it, he said it 14 different ways. He's not a coach who's really worried about wins and losses, especially week one of the preseason. Vic Fangio, on the other hand, is a new coach in his first game, which tends to be a bet-on situation in August. The coach that wants to win usually wins these type of games. So Quinn doesn't care. The market's like the new coach in their first game. And more than any other factor, there's a quarterback battle in Denver. There's no quarterback battle in Atlanta. All that being said, I wouldn't expect to see either of the two quarterbacks battling for the job in Denver for extended stretches on Thursday night. I can understand the line move, but if you liked... Denver, you've missed it, flat out. If you're betting the Broncos at two and a half now, good luck. That you know, you're not going to win long term on the wrong end of three and a half point line moves for single event games in the preseason, in my opinion. Look. Let's flip it back over to baseball a little bit here, Ted. I can't wait to talk football. We're going to have so much fun here throughout the rest of the summer and obviously getting through September and October right here on that betting show. But it's a lot of money to be made back in baseball and a lot of lines that are out there moving. Checking out SBRodds.com. One is on the move also here. The Marlins and Caleb Smith getting a little bit of love today. Opening up at minus 115 as a favorite for the Diamondbacks. Now shifting down to around a pick them there. You can find minus 103, minus 104, depending on where you're shopping at there. Low total of 7.5 compared to most of the games that are put out each and every day. Kelly versus Smith tonight here, Teddy. Yeah, and we really can't be surprised that the Marlins have taken money in this game because Caleb Smith has been a wise guy favorite all year long. He's coming off an absolute gem uh, in his last outing where he shut down uh, the White Sox. And you look at Merrill Kelly. He has the antithesis of Caleb Smith's support when it comes to the wise guys because his advanced metrics don't come up with the stats that the wise guys are looking for, the XFIPs. The strikeouts per nine, and just 7.2 strikeouts per nine, um, those are stats that the advanced metric markets don't like and won't support, hence the money for Miami, who has played better ball over the course of the last week. Dodgers road swing continues here, Teddy. Taking a look going, and hey, we got some hot environment there in, in Colorado tonight. Over 90 degrees, Teddy, wind blowing out 10, 11 miles an hour. Maeda opens up here at minus 155, but we've seen it shrink back into the 130s. Even some options out here at SBRodds.com in the high 120s. Total sitting now at 12 and a half and 13s starting the breakthrough tonight. Maeda versus Gray. Yeah, and I, I mean, Maeda's been real good at Coors Field. Uh, 10 starts there. 5-1 and one with a 3.12 ERA. He's not a pitcher that we worry about pitching in Colorado. Not like the Rockies are playing good ball right now by any stretch of the imagination. The Dodgers lost in Washington on Sunday, travel after the loss, just 5-4 and four in their last nine ball games. They're about to win 70 if they win this game tonight. The urgency isn't there for the Dodgers, whereas the Rockies with John Gray on the hill this evening, and Gray's been good. He's allowed three runs uh, or less in six of his last seven starts. Uh, although he did get hit uh, with a line drive in his right calf uh, last week. He had to exit the game uh, afterwards. But the markets think he's going to be fine. They're expecting John Gray's current run of success to continue. A pitcher who the wise guys have supported a fair bit in recent seasons, getting support again at Coors Field tonight. Let's get some of the bigger action tonight here, Teddy. Right on that betting show. Watch what you bet tonight. How about this? The Braves look to extend their lead over the NL East. Going to take on the Nationals in Washington, D.C. And, Teddy, you do need a little bit of breaks here throughout the season to try to, you know, ramp up that division lead and possibly make a playoff run. Looks like you're maybe going to miss out on Max Scherzer as a starting opportunity for the Washington Nationals as he continues to struggle with a little bit of a lingering back issue. But tonight, Nationals open up as a favorite here. Minus 148, total of 9.5. Patrick Corbin's been on the mound. He's been really good for the Nationals this year as a free agent product. Dallas Keiko rounding back in the form of the lefty. But the one thing we do know about the Nationals, Teddy, they do tend to hit left-handed pitching pretty well. Braves come into this one 62-44 and 44 in the season. The Nationals 56-49. and 49. The Braves already did their job in Philadelphia, Teddy, winning two of three. If they can win the series in Washington, that's going to put a lot between them and the people behind them in the NL East here. 
Sure, although it's not going to be easy to knock off the Nets. I mean, Corbin, uh, you talk about Scherzer's issues and Scherzer, you know, dealing with the back injury. They had to use a bullpen game on Saturday the first time all year. They've had to do that. But Corbin's been the bright spot. You know, he's been very good uh, of late, and he's been great against Atlanta. You know, 5-1, and one, a buck 84 uh, ERA, and eight starts against them. Uh, so he's got a pretty good track record against this particular lineup, you know, coming off that six shutout innings against the Rockies uh, last time out. And, you know, you look at the other uh, piece of the equation, the Nats have owned Keuchel. I mean, they've owned him. Uh, current Washington hitters, 369 against him, an OPS of 974. Keuchel coming off a game in which 12 strikeouts, only two runs on three hits. And the team still didn't beat the Royals. That concerns me here <laughs> uh, for sure. Keuchel, not a guy I'm excited about putting my money on. Not against this lineup, and not tonight. It'll be Nationals or pass for this better. Yeah, it looks like, you know, Dallas Keuchel, obviously, you know, lower volume, or excuse me, lower velocity type pitching. We'll see how that holds up tonight. It is a hitting environment again on the East Coast. It is warm and muggy. How about this one? Talk about a hitting environment. Slugging Pittsburgh Pirates head into Cincinnati tonight. And how about Sonny Gray? You know, we're talking about this traded deadline here with the New York Yankees trying to add pitching. Boy, it would have been nice if Sonny Gray pitching held up in the Bronx where they wouldn't have to make any moves or get rid of him or even try to add on. But he's going to be on the mound tonight. He's been pretty good, Teddy. The Reds, 48 and 55 on the season. The Pirates, 46 and 59 on the season. The Reds, Heavy favorites here. Looking at SBRodds.com right now, Teddy. We're talking about openers around 177, 180 in that range. Now up as high as 192 with a total of nine and a half live from Cincinnati tonight. I mean, if you're riding the hot and fading the cold, you're not betting on Pittsburgh right now. You know, the Pirates have been god awful uh, in all kinds of different ways <laughs> in recent weeks. They've lost eight in a row. They've lost 14 out of 16. They're most assuredly a team that is struggling to find supporters in the betting markets. Clint Hurdle, quote, the harsh reality is we haven't played well for two weeks. The optimism is, as I said, there's been six games that we could have won along the way, and that flips the record with one hit or one well-placed out. So the old, oh, well, we could have won six games, but instead we're 0-8 during this span. <laughs> That's not a bet on quote, uh, in my opinion. And you, know, you talked about Sonny Gray, you know, and he's been pretty good. His last five starts, buck 62 ERA, uh, pitched well against the, the Brewers, in his last outing, he's been solid against the Pirates. Um, you know, uh, 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 lost his first two starts of the season against Pittsburgh, but rebounded, gave up uh, one run his last time out against the Pirates. And Jordan Lyles has been as bad as the Pirates has. You know, 0-6 his last eight starts, just bombed. Uh, maybe he reached his low point, but he couldn't get anyone out in St. Louis last Tuesday. Three homers, eight runs allowed, seven hits. Uh, didn't last long. Pittsburgh, a difficult team for me to support right now. I'm not interested in backing ice-cold squads, even in this big plus-price range. How about some ice-cold squads we're going to talk about right here, Teddy? Not so much the Angels, which, you know, welcoming the worst team in baseball, the Detroit Tigers, but also just had a rendezvous with the Orioles. They almost got swept at home. We'll see if they can turn the tide back on the Detroit Tigers tonight. The Angels open up as a heavy favorite tonight, Teddy. Minus 240, total of 10 and a half. The Tigers enter the season. This is not a misprint here. 30 wins, 71 losses. The Angels are 55 and 52. And Zimmerman is on the mound. And if that's any indication, you're going to be climbing to try to get yourself into that Los Angeles Angels lineup tonight to try to get after him. Should be a decent one, maybe for total backers here. But we'll see if the Detroit Tigers can hold up tonight in this battle. Yeah, I mean, that was a big win yesterday for the Angels. After losing the first three at home to Baltimore, and they were down again yesterday, and they rallied back with a walk-off home run, you know, a couple of dingers. Uh, for L.A. to get back in that game. That's a momentum builder for a team that definitely could have used one. Of course, the Tigers could use some momentum, you think? You know, what have they lost? Six straight, 12 out of 13. They're 2-14 and 14 since the All-Star break. They're 4-28 and 28 in their last 32 games. Oh, by the way, 1-24, their last 25 games against the AL West. Now, all of that is rearview mirror. If you've been betting against the Tigers for the last month, more power to you. You made a bunch of money. But recognize the Tigers are not going to go 4-32 and 32 in their next 36 games. They're not going to lose 12 in their next 13. I'm not interested in backing a team that is absolutely falling apart right now. And Zimmerman certainly hasn't been a pitcher worthy of a whole lot of support in recent weeks. But you have to be aware when you're fading a team like the Tigers – Markets aren't sleeping on how bad they've been, and the worst for Detroit is probably over. 
How about this one, Teddy? Talk a little bit of off the mic section here with a nice little summer run as we talk about heading up the football season. How about 16 year olds out here, Teddy, playing video games and earning up to $3 million for wins? There used to be an old song out there Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Mama, let your babies grow up to be video game players. Kyle Geistor, 16 years old out of Pennsylvania, a $3 million check. Second place, Teddy, $1.8 million. Third place, $1.2 million. And my favorite quote of all of this. It says right here, second place finisher, Harrison Chang. It's great representing the old dudes. Experience and composure trump everything. Fortnite is a young man's game, though. Teddy, the man is 24. Which speaks volumes about what the <laughs> video... And when you talk about well, the, the professional video game players and what we're going to be seeing in this regard over the course of the next decade or two decades, A, we're going to see betting handle explode. We're going to see it explode uh, on video games and gaming tournaments and that sort of thing. That you can smell it in the air already. And two, is that the guys who are winning these things are going to be like the tennis phenoms. They're going to be 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 years old. I love it. The 24-year-old old guy, uh, you know, uh, it's great representing old dudes. Experience and composure trump everything. There's something to be said, you know. Experience and composure for a 24-year-old is greater than that for a 14 or a 16-year-old. But when you talk about this kind of prize money, the field of athletics is changing out there, and video games, absolutely a piece of the puzzle. Yep, give it one to two years right here on that betting show. Teddy and I will be breaking down Fortnite and every other competition here, but we're designed to get out of here in 20 minutes or less. We're going to do that today. Thank you for tuning in for July 29, 2019. We are back. We are ready to go. We're going to carry you through the rest of the summer. We're going to get you through football season. It's going to be a lot of fun right here on that one-stop shop for all your sports betting needs. Once again, he's Teddy Sabranti. Give him a follow on Twitter at Teddy underscore covers. I'm Donnie Seymour at Right Side VP. We'll be back tomorrow to do it all over again. Thanks once again for joining us.